action. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of The Grudge Report. We are going to talk about The Expanse Season 5, Episode 6, an episode titled Tribes. I'm Margaret Reeb. I'm a member of the development team at the SETI Institute, and I'm joined by Frank Marchis, who is the, uh, he is a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute and chief science officer at Unicellar. And he's here because he's done tons of calculations about the science nuggets in this episode of the show that we're going to get into. But before we do, before we get into the nitty gritty details, I should warn you that we are going to spoil everything in the expanse through this episode, which again is season five, episode six. So if you haven't seen it yet, definitely hit pause, go get caught up and come back so that you can hear us talk about all the things we loved and all the cool science in this episode. So Frank, I'm going to turn it over to you first. What what did you think of the beginning view that we get in this episode, the beginning scene where we see that impact crater on Earth? Yeah, it's a side view. I mean, it's uh, I don't know what's, which, which uh, city she, she was watching first, but um, you can see part of the seawall has, have collapsed, the level. Uh, there is a tower too, which is kind of uh, this partially destroyed. And then we see the scene in uh, the countryside where we can see the trees falling off. It's, uh, yeah, it's a devastation after uh, an asteroid impact. That's what you expect to see, basically. Yes devastation and we get a little bit more of that when we follow amos and peaches <laughs> the woman that he calls peaches um miss mao because they are navigating through earth through some forest to try and get back to baltimore and she she looks up at the sky and talks about what she thinks is the moon but amos points out well no it's the sun but it's it's clouded over is that dust in the atmosphere yeah that's probably impact? dust in the atmosphere in fact and uh and since she's kind of sick as well she probably did not connect the dots and uh she noticed that what she's watching is not the moon but um, the the sun covered with dust um i don't know where you uh, in san francisco in march or in april we had that here Oh, uh, it was fire. after wild fires, yeah. yeah. Yes. And after the fire, basically the the sun was like that. the The sky was white, whitish, and we could barely see uh, the sun through the through the crowds, through the the for, the smoke of the forest. This is due to par- absorption of the particle of uh, of smoke, in fact. Yeah. But what I like the most is the scene where you see the trees, because it totally reminded me. Um, when I was a kid and I saw the picture of, um, of one of the first impact crater uh, detected, uh, observed, witnessed by human, modern human, that was in uh, June 30, 1908. I was not born. I know <laughs> you say that wrong, Garrett, but I was not born. <laughs> Being uh, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. That was an impact in, um, in Siberia. And it happened like uh, during the revolution over there. So it's kind of, uh, we had to wait years before sending people over there. And when they went over there, they basically reported what people saw. They saw this very bright flash in the sky and they fell from the, from the ground uh, because, of the heat, because of the shock wave. And uh, when they came back, they noticed that the entire forest was devastated. All the trees was basically aligned in the same direction. The impact, they estimated that the impact was uh, five megaton of TNTs, which is in the same order that we have in the show, in fact, if you remember the case. Really? Yeah. Okay. So that's 100 times the the power of uh, the Hiroshima blast. So that's enough to uh, turn trees and produce a tsunami and destroy seawalls and buildings, of course. And that's what we can see here. It's a side view. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also had ripple effects on the government, which is something that we see in the opening scene as well. We have the person, the man who is now the acting secretary general approach Avasarala. And uh, I believe he's the transport minister or something akin to that. So it's pretty clear that quite a few people bit the dust, unfortunately, in the leadership chain. And he is 
probably very underqualified for <laughs> the job that now faces him. So I think this is the way that Officer All is going to get more involved in her, her return to power. But um, she's pretty rightfully devastated um, because she's from the area mm-hmm. where one of the one of the asteroids impacted. Um, and and, and we no get news of her husband. no news. I mean, something like this would definitely take down communication systems, don't you think? Yes, that's uh, that's one of the major problems. In fact, it's the uh, an impact like that will basically disrupt uh, the communication pro- the communication of Earth, and it will be very difficult for people to know what's going on, what happened, to organize the um, the emergency situation, to address issues. Hospital will will be uh, probably uh, over overcrowded and so FEMA has been working on that in fact in organizing really? those kind of um, uh, emergency situation in case of asteroid impact what to do what to send first who to take care of first you need training to address this kind of situation yeah or the chaos that comes after I'm sure there's yeah. plenty of things uh, well I'm glad FEMA's on it somebody somebody needs to be paying attention um so this is all, so I guess we get some of this on Luna, and then we get some of this peek into what's going on on Earth, on Earth, where, because we have Amos and Peaches walking around. And they have a lot of really nice character moments, I guess, if you can call them nice, where they talk yeah. about monstrous qualities and body modifications. But um, Clarissa also makes a comment about Schrodinger's parents. So, Frank, what is Schrodinger's cat and all this? What is what what is she alluding to? So she explained to uh, to Amos in a very nice way. I, li- I like the way she explained <laughs> to that that those are parents you never hear from. And you don't know if they exist or they uh, they're dead or alive until you check up on them because they don't give you news. So she has this kind of parents apparently. So that's the analogy to uh, the. Uh, quantum mechanics uh, Schrodinger cat, which is um, it's a it's an uh, an experiment which is not a real one; it's a thought experiment um, to illustrate the the paradox of uh, quantum uh, mechanics or quantum superposition. We call that. So basically, um, if you put an hypothetical cat into a box, it can be both dead or alive. And the only way you can, like, like a particle in the in the quantum mechanic, can have different states. And the only way to uh, to know if she's dead or alive is to look at the experiment. The experiment, basically. You force it to choose, right? Yes, exactly. So in quantum mechanics, which is one of the crazy uh, science that I studied when I was uh, a student, you basically assume different states for particles with different probability, and you go with that. And you make all your calculation based on that. And at the end, something will come out of this. And it's, it's extraordinary that it does work. And it's extraordinary that uh, thanks to quantum mechanics, we have GPS, we have uh, plasma TV. All of these that you see around you come from this basically weird paradox, a uh, quantum paradox that we, are, we have accepted as scientists and and I'm very glad that it's now going to the normal discussion because people... It's most mainstream. People yeah, it's mainstream. Now people know the Schrodinger cat. So it's yeah. going on mainstream. As a cat person, it makes me sad that <laughs> you chose a cat to be <laughs> dead or alive in the box. But it is very, it's very wacky and weird um, when you get down to that quantum level, how everything is. Yep. It's, it's just all over the place. Um I did like that shout out. It was it was nice, and I think it also speaks to her background as a character because she's from you know her family. Her father was very smart and evil, but smart, and so she clearly is educated and, and knows a lot about scientific processes and theories. Um, anything else on Earth before we move along to Bobby and Alex? No, for the science, nothing special. Nothing. Maybe some well, things, but no, no science. No science, yes, but good scenes. Uh, speaking of good scenes and science, we have Bobby and Alex who were on their racing ship and were spotted last episode by the Belters and the Martians who were doing some sort of transaction. And what I thought happened was 
Alex dumped the Epstein drive and they were free floating through space. But we get some scenes from the Razorback that seem to indicate they're more in control of the situation than we thought. Yes, so they basically pretend to be uh, unable to uh, move around and uh, they wait for the Belter to come close to them. And um, Bobby use a fantastic uh, Mars. What's the name of this? It's a. a I think it's a, the Goliath suit. Yeah. It's pretty great. It's a pretty great thing. Yeah, it's kind of uh, mm -hmm. it provides protection and uh, superhuman strength at the same time. So I mean, it's a perfect weapon. And Alex is hiding, and he jump over the um, the the corridor that they created to call to to uh, put together the two spaceship and uh, place a bomb there and uh, come back. And I love the comeback. In fact, that's one of the best scenes of this episode, I think. Um, when he, he was just, he jumped and launched himself yeah. towards the, yeah. It's called a, a space jump. And uh, frankly, <laughs> it looks very easy in the movie, but it's a very complicated uh, uh, mo movement. So, because when you jump like that, it's basically when you, as soon you leave the spacecraft, you have gotten the acceleration necessary, your motion will be basically a rectiling motion, uniform and rectiling motion. So you have to aim right, right at the beginning, because if you aim wrong, it's over. You cannot move. If you don't have any propulsion system, you go straight and that's all, and you miss the, space, the spaceship, it's over. Goodbye, uh, Alex. We're not going to see you again. <laughs> so it does work. <laughs> so I made some calculation because I thought that was an interesting um, um, kind of science here. Um, so if you are, if an astronaut is floating like Alex was doing uh, mm -hmm. outside a spacecraft, and then he starts pushing the spacecraft, okay, because of Newton's third law, which is action reaction. The push uh, that the action, that the the strength, the force that is applying to push will be also apply on the spacecraft. So in fact, the two body will move apart of it from each other. But since the mass of the of the of the astronaut is smaller than the mass of the spacecraft, the the effect will be will be different. The acceleration is the same, but not the uh, the, the strength is the the force is the same, but not the acceleration. Right. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to bore people to death with this, but I found out that when you jump, you basically have an average force of 1,800 Newton. Okay, so I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to assume the weight of uh, Alex is 65 kilogram, okay, and he jump by uh, 85 centimeters. That's where I come from, the 1,800 Newton. Okay. So that's when the acceleration will be 27 point 20, 30 meters uh, meter per, square, per, per second square. So if he has a push which lasts half a second, okay, it means that as soon as okay. he escapes the spacecraft, he will have a velocity of uh, 29 miles per hour, which is 50 kilometers per hour. That's so he could, that's like a, and if he smacks against the, his spaceship where he's trying to go, that's a, like a small car crash impact. Yeah, it's basically the speed of a backer, backer going downhill. 50 years. So it would hurt. That's a, I, that was way more than I thought. To me, when they do the space, like vacuum of space, it almost feels like jello like they're just kind of floating nicely through jello but that puts it into perspective he's really smacking pretty hard against yeah. the razor back there's no reference to so that's why he looks mellow like this because you can see anything in the background to give you an idea of the speed that's true see the yeah. spacecraft that you realize that you're about to hit it and yeah. if i read somewhere on, on on internet so it must be true that astronaut the first <laughs> time they go in the international space station they have this problem that they don't realize that by pushing with their hands or arms strongly, they will go super fast very quickly. So they have this moment where they to adapt to the fact that they need to gentle, gently push themselves against the wall. Because if they soon they push too much, they can crash onto the instruments onto their other astronauts and it can be uh, painful, of course. So there is a learn yeah. learning curve here. So yeah, I bored you to death with my calculation, but the, the point- That was is not boring at all. 
I mean, what, poor Alex. <laughs> the point is that he's going. He was going fast, very fast, and that's the reason he, it looks very uh, intense uh, doing this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean, we probably can't calculate, but it, Bobby also went through some intense trauma when she was trying to hold the her spaceship and the barrier, the like boarding ramp, yeah. because the the Martians. Are, I couldn't tell. I think they were Belters. The People trying to board her ship were trying to pull away. So um, it was a rough day for for Bobby and Alex. But I I thought that was a, one of the best scenes, like you said, of the entire episode. Anything else on these guys? They're no. some of my favorites, so I like oh, talking yes, about yes, them. Should we? Yes. Do this? Oh, something I really like. Uh, you may not like to watch the show with me, obviously, because uh, I spend my I, I post the show like multiple times. When I notice <laughs> on the Razorback, there is a, a bunch of diagrams, and some of them was capture my my attention because they look like something familiar. And in fact, those are it's kind of an history of a spacecraft. It starts at the bottom. I thought it was the man bird of Leonardo da Vinci, but Phantom.com claimed that it's Icarus. Icarus, the famous legendary. Uh, it's a demigod, semigod, I think, who wanted to fly high and uh, reach the sun. But anyway, that's Icarus. And then on the top of this, we have the silhouette of another spacecraft. And I'll let you say this: which one is this one? Because it's uh, I have always a hard time with the name. The Wright. The Wright Brothers. Yes, thank you. The Wright Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Flyer. That's the name of it. And then the we flyer. have the spirit of Saint Louis, another um, airplane. And then we have the silhouette of the Boeing 747. I recognize this. That's the one who caught my attention because I recognize this one right away. It's, uh, it's very the 747. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And then we have the Space Shuttle. And, and then the Virgin Galactic one that exists at the moment and is going to fly probably soon uh, with tourists on board. And then the we supersonic. Have uh, that that's the, the one that goes that. to go very high up to uh, 100 kilometers and stay for 15 mm -hmm. minutes and then uh, glide back uh, on the ground. Down. Oh, okay. Got yeah. And then we do have, uh, now we're entering in science fiction, uh, the Epstein drive ship. You probably remember in one of the season, I think that was season two or three, we have the story of this, uh, of this spaceship. And then we have the Razorback. So it's kind of... Um, uh, yeah, it's the history of, of of flying and starting from human Icarus all the way to Razorback. I'm gonna go back and rewatch the episode again and and find this. That's very. I will post a picture and it was on this. I, yeah, sure. throw it up as they say in the show. Put it up there. Um, that's yeah. That was a detail that I missed, but I like it when this the show does a really good job of world building and cr and creating those sorts of mirrors into the past or you know our current time frame so you know i wonder if this was in the book so i didn't read the book so if people read the book don't hesitate let us know if this let us know in the comments was in the book yeah yeah yes uh so let's leave our favorite martians um because every it seems like everybody else on mars is a traitor because they are working with marco mm -hmm. and the belters um and i would just like to say that my girl Kamina Drummer is back in action she had some great some great scenes uh in this episode not a lot of science but i just have to say before we get into the belter storyline that i was glad to see her and her crew so um marco when he's making a pitch sort of to kamina because she doesn't really have that much of a choice about how he's going to use agriculture which has been the tool that the inner worlds have used to control the Belteries. He's going to flip the script and create some sort of agricultural economy where the Belters can feed themselves. And he thinks he can do it using the moons of the outer system. I'm guessing primarily Jupiter. So Frank, I heard somebody told me you might've done some calculations. Yeah, to no, this that would was be possible. <laughs> Yeah, now this got my attention because because of the way he presented this. Uh, during the conversation, one of the um, partner of Drummer basically mentioned how we're going to live. We need to f you need to feed these people, the Belters. And uh, we right. depend on the agricultural uh, strengths of Earth. 
and Marco is 100% sure that he can basically get, uh, get rid of this uh, Earth's uh, dependency by um, producing food on icy moons. I, I don't know what he says exactly. I think he says moons of Jupiter and Saturn, something like that. Mm -hmm. Because the, remember, the moons are, are controlled by the, by the Earther. But since Earth is under attack, uh, Marco is uh, hoping probably to take over the moons, the control of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So, and he say he, he said to a guy, "Look at this uh, made by this engineer or scientist, the one who created the Ganymede AG domes." And he sent he sent him the data. I said, "Look at the facts and figures and learn. We have a solution." Okay. So we don't know the facts and figures, of course, because uh, it's, uh, it's a movie and I didn't have time to look at this in detail when he, he passed the, <laughs> the, the data. But right. I, I made a very naive calculation. I say, let's assume that we can make the entire surface of each of the moons, so Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io, fully, um, uh, fully um, capable of having agriculture. Okay, anyway, any technology, the domes or something like that. Mm -hmm. The surface of those moons all together will be uh, 230 million square kilometers. The surface of continents on Earth, solid surface, is 148, uh, 148 million square kilometers. So the surface of the four moons together is larger than the surface of Earth's uh, continental plate. So that's the okay. reason so that's it's not impossible in a way. If you solve all the problem, I mean, I'm sure you have some stuff to tell me, right? This is a very nice <laughs> calculation. So go ahead, tell, criticize. No, no, it's, I'm not criticizing it. I think that Marco definitely, there's enough space out there did you notice my pun? There's enough space out there on the moon of the distant, of the icy planets of Jupiter, Saturn, whatever, for him to to execute this plan. But that would require uh, creating domes or terraforming the moons because currently they're quite cold, many of them, um, and they don't they don't have the proper soil or oxygen levels or liquid water to sustain plants. It's also included to me if he wants livestock to be a part of this because that would be a whole nother or if he just plans to have people eat soy um i i i like i admire how passionate he is about this and how he's you know committed to the cause but um the technology is probably there that, and they probably don't want to waste precious airtime describing it but it's also we saw the didn't we see the ganymede um agricultural dome go completely down with a proto molecule attack. So I guess in the same way that on Earth we have famines or droughts, you could have catastrophic failures on the moon. Yeah. Mm. It's, a very so, fragile, it's much more fragile to have domes like this on, on the moons of, uh, of Jupiter than uh, to have an entire planet capable of producing food, of course. Uh, yes. But you know, I, mean, I don't know if you may have noticed, but Marco is kind of a charismatic di dictator a little bit, kind of. He seems like a very, very balanced person and not like he's unhinged at all. <laughs> so I don't think he's, he's, he has his ideas and he's kind of person who decided that this is going to be this way. And in French, we call that la folie des grandeurs. And I always try to find a translation for that, but I think there is none in English, which is basically someone who lives in his own dreams of grandiose plans and uh, completely lost grasp with the reality. And I think Marco is a bit like that. I think that that is described him perfectly. <laughs> yes. And I, I understand where this is rooted in, right? Because the belters are the ones that work in these conditions and are constantly having things that I would argue are a basic human right, water, air, held over them to do the dirty work of the inner planet. So I understand that it seems right that the people who are working on these stations should own the goods and have a stake in it, but it just seems like there's a way to come and meet in the middle, but, but it's probably too far gone for Marco. Um, and he's got a lot of people behind him. So I, I, I liked that, that shout out. And I also love the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So I'm glad that people are visiting them. Um, though didn't, didn't they say that tourists go to Titan? So yes. I, that, that one's out in terms of 
plants. Um, so in fact, I made the calculation. If you had Titan, it's 316 million square kilometer. So it's tw twice the surface of, uh, of Earth's uh, continental plate. So, so you need Titan, probably. No, you, you don't need Titan. But if Titan is... Oh, you don't? It's been like... Uh, you have way more, uh, but you have so many trouble to problem to fix. I mean, temperature, it's very low, the temperature over there. The atmosphere is high. Uh, there is radiation. I mean, there is a lot of trouble to uh, to deal with. And one of the belter mentioned that. He said, well, it's going to take a, a while. And, and Marco, again, completely ignore it. There will be some tough time. But we're yes, uh, I, I like that. Oh, it's going to be hard for the first couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> hard is sounds like an under statement it sounds like some people may starve um it seems like it might be i i, be, I don't know I'm, I'm just throwing this out there it might be easier for them to go into the rings and find a planet that they can grow plants on than colonizing the moons but that yeah, probably but they cannot comes... go on the planet remember i feel like that some that some of them should be able they could take turns i don't know either way the, their options are not great but um it, it seems like most of the belters are convinced and Kamina, of course, and her crew join up. And it's not necessarily because they're super passionate about the cause, but it's because Marco has put them in a corner. But nonetheless, they are involved now in his plot, his farming plot. So. Yeah, and it's the entire family. I can, that's something also we didn't mention, but uh, Jomero has this very interesting space uh, um, team uh, they're not really a team. They are polyamorous uh, relationship, and I uh, they kind of show that in the show. And she say that clearly because when she they exchange uh, one of the crew member, he say he's not crew, he's family. So yep. They lost, yeah. yep, they lost a member of their their family, their yeah. relationship that they have with. I don't know. It seems like there are maybe six to eight people. In her, yeah, on her, we say that, yeah, ship, yeah. yeah. So, and, but that was also an interesting tactic where he talks, where Marco talks about this exchange of different crew members because generally a crew is from the same faction promotes this sort of unity, and I think it also probably promotes some level of like distrust. It it reminds me a little bit of cults where they have people who are assigned to watch other people. And it sort of like creates this like self-reporting system because mm -hmm. you can probably sniff out any discontent or potential mutiny because he has different people who aren't necessarily loyal to each other working together. Um, I thought that was a very bold and smart tactic on Marco's part. So. Yep, definitely. Yep. But that's all for me for this it one. No more science to discuss oh, in this one? No, that's all. That's all. No. Well, uh, the only thing I will say is that I, I did like the title of the episode, Tribes. Uh, it seems a little on the nose, but there was a lot of discussion about Earth becoming tribal, if you want to say, of breaking into different warring tribes, uh, different groups of people, given that it's kind of a doggy dog world right now because of the chaos. And then, of course, Marco is unifying the different factions of the Belters and sort of bringing people together. So it's an interesting play because usually you think of Earth as quite unified and the Belters is ununified, but we're yeah. seeing a big flip. So that's, so that's, uh, that, that's there is, they, they, they claim there is hundreds different factions in the Belters because there is so many asteroids, a million of them. So they all live kind of far away from each other for years and they probably uh, develop this kind of uh, a tribal spirit culture and they come from the same area of earth you may have noticed that because they have uh, different accents which seems to suggest they come from different pl same places like there is a group who are speaking kind of uh Aishan, and a group who are speaking more kind of arabic at the beginning of the season the first season one and two we see that more in fact and yeah. uh, when drummer enter in the spacecraft in the um, in the um, in marco spaceship she mentioned oh they are this and they are this. She noticed already that there is multiple tribes already in the spacecraft. Yeah, I think I, I can't remember the name of them, but I remember that too. She mentions two of them, like you said, yeah. and they're different, but they're also seem they also seem to be quite powerful 
in terms of like the ranking of the different groups. But yeah, it's, yeah, they do. Yeah, there are different dialects. And I'm sure if you live on like an insulated asteroid, you lose connection even to other belters because you live in a different environment and you don't really, don't really go anywhere. It seems like with belters, but it was a great episode. I loved it. I know we're going to be back soon to talk about episode seven. So we will sign off for now. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. We love talking about the expanse. We love talking about science. This show, the grudge report is a product of the study Institute. And the study Institute is a nonprofit research institution whose mission is to understand the nature and origin of life in the universe. And like I said, we are a nonprofit, so we rely on the donations of generous supporters, people who like to watch the videos, people who care about the mission, people who um, go to the website and find some sort of spiritual connection with our mission. So if you're so inclined, you can click one of the various links below to keep in touch Uh, to learn more about the SETI Institute, um, and even to donate if you are so inclined, and we would very much appreciate it. So until next time, we're signing off.